Hi class, and welcome to your first video lesson for Chapter 2, Section 2.1. It's titled Relations and Functions. So let's define what those words mean. What a relation is, is it's just a set of ordered pairs. So you guys know how to define ordered pairs. The x-axis is what comes first, so this would be 3 to the right. The y-axis comes second, it's 3 to high, so we call that point 3, 3. This point right here would be 1, 2. And you guys, I'm sure, remember that from previous math classes. A relation is just a set of ordered pairs. The domain is the x value. So you're going to hear me say that a lot this year. The domain and the range, the domain, the domain is just the x values. And then the range, then, is the y values. So our y values would be this number 3 right here and this 2 right here. It is just the y values. So that's those three things. Make sure you remember what those three terms are. Another one is function. A function is a special type of relation in which each element of the domain is paired with exactly one element of the range. To give you a hint here, whenever you see a list of ordered pairs, whenever you see a relation, you know it's going to be a function if your x's do not repeat. So it might be a good idea to write this down. X's cannot repeat. However, the y's can. Okay? So if it's going to be a function, your x's in the same relation can never repeat, but the y's can, and it can still be a function. Let's just quickly name our relation here. So let's just li list down all of these ordered pairs. So this one right here is at left 3, up 1. So it's a negative 3, 1. And then we have 0, 2 for this point, And then we have 1, Sorry, 2, negative 1 for our third point. Let's continue going through that. You guys can do these rest two on your own. Negative 2, 1. 1, 2. And 3, 1. And then lastly, negative 1, negative 2. 1, 2 and 1, negative 1. So now we ask ourselves, is this a function? Well, our definition, breaking it down, x's cannot repeat. So in this one, negative 3, 0, 2, x's do not repeat. Yes, this is a function. Let's look at our middle graph, our middle relation. Negative 2, positive 1, positive 3. x's do not repeat. Yes, this is a function. Let's look at our last one. Negative 1, positive 1, positive 1. Uh-oh, we have 1 and 1. They are repeating, so this would be a no. It is not a function. So whenever you get the list of ordered pairs, just look at the x's. They cannot repeat. If they do, it's not a function. If you're given a graph, which we are given one in this one, as I scroll down, it says the vertical line test. This is a very, very basic concept that I'm sure you guys have been introduced to before. It also helps determine if a relation is a function. So all the vertical line test states is that if I draw a vertical line straight up and down, it can only touch one point at a time. So it touches one point at a time there, one point at a time there, one point at a time there. Yes, this is a function. Going off to this one, it can only touch one point at a time. It touches one point there, one point there, one point there. Yes, this is a function. In order for it to be a function on a graph, it, a vertical line can only touch one and only one point at a time. It touches one point there, and bam, it touches two points there. So that automatically makes it not a function. That's how you get the no. So if you ever have to see if something is a function or not, if you have to see if a relation is a function or not, if you get the ordered pairs, just use this. The x's cannot repeat, the y's can. If you're given a graph with the relation on a graph, just use the vertical line test. It can touch one point at a time. It cannot touch two or more points. That is an easy way to determine whether a relation is a function or not. And now there's another special type of function, and this is called the one-to-one -one function. This is where a function where every y has exactly one x. So in our terms, it means the x's cannot repeat. The y's also cannot repeat. 
So whenever we're given a list of ordered pairs, that's what we can use. If we're given the graph, now we could also use the horizontal line test. So let's go back here. We know that the first two are functions. Are they one-to-one -one functions? Which means that my x's cannot repeat, my y's also cannot repeat. So looking here, x's, we already found out they did not repeat. How about my y's? One, two, negative one. They did not repeat. So if my x's didn't repeat, my y's didn't repeat, it's a function, and it's also one-to-one. -one. Let's look at my second one. We already know that our x's didn't repeat. Let's look at our y's. One, two, one. Our y's repeated right here and right here. So it is a function because my x's didn't repeat. However, it is not one, two, one. Okay, let's be clear on that. It is a function, but it's not one to one. And then our third one, if it's not going to be a function, it's not one to one either. So you don't even have to worry about that. It has to be a function first in order for it to be a one to one function. And then the second clue on this slide right here is it says you can check by using the horizontal line test. So if you're given a graph, all you got to do is let's take this line right here. Let's make it horizontal. And now it can still only touch one point at a time. One point, one point, one point. Bam. That, my friends, is a one-to-one -one function. Right here, horizontal line, bam, two points. If it touches two points or more, it is not a one-to-one -one function. So it fails the horizontal line test. This is not one-to-one. -one. Okay? So if you need to use ordered pairs, think x's cannot repeat, y's cannot repeat. If you're given a graph, use your horizontal line test, and if it touches at more than one point, it is not going to be a one-to-one -one function. All right, that covers that. Now we're going to talk about function notation. This is also very, very important. It's a very basic concept. It's not difficult at all, but you have to understand the terminology or the language about it. Here are three different functions. A function of x, um, and it's, it, they're just labeled in different ways. f of x, g of x, and h of x. I like to call these different machines, okay? Different machines give you a different product, okay? So if we look at this, it says find f of a negative 2. So what this f tells me, class, is that I'm putting this negative 2 into a certain machine, and it is the f machine. So instead of saying f of x equals x cubed minus 3, I'm now saying f of a negative 2. So if I put a negative 2 in for this x, then I'm going to put a negative 2 in for this x as well. So that's all that it's saying. I'm not going to put it into the g function. I'm not going to put it into the h function. I am going to put it into the f function because that's what this letter right here tells me. So f of a negative 2, what does it equal? Well, instead of x cubed, it's a negative 2 cubed minus 3. So now we simply evaluate this. A negative 2 cubed is a negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2, which is a negative 8. And a negative 8 minus 3, my answer of a negative 2, so when I put a negative 2 into the f function, or the f machine is what I like to call it, I get an answer of a negative 11. Okay, pretty basic. You guys pause the video, please. Try number 2 on your own. All right, after you've tried number two, you should have got this. G of 6 is no longer G of X. I'm putting 6 into the G machine. So G of 6 equals 3 times 6 squared minus 3 times X, which we now know X is 6, minus 2. So now I'm just going to evaluate this. I'm going to use my order of operations. It's very, very important that you remember that. You're going to start with exponents, so it's 3 times 6 squared, or 3 times 36, minus 18, minus 2. So now you're going to multiply 3 times 36, and when we multiply those two, we get 108. 108 minus 18 minus 2. So when we subtract those, we get an answer of 88. Hopefully you got that when you did it by yourself. If you did not get that, hopefully you could see my work and find out why I got 88. Number three is very similar. We're just going to throw in a variable. Okay? So once again, it's going to ask me to put 2b into my f machine. This f tells me what function to put it into. So instead of saying f of x, I'm saying f of 2b. So I'm going to put 2b in there as well. So f of 2b equals x cubed, which is now 2b 
raised to the third power minus 3. So you might have to remember from intermediate algebra how to cube a variable. 2b times 2b times 2b. Well, 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. And then b times b times b is b raised to the third power. We'll go over some more of those in class when I see you um, tomorrow. And then we subtract 3. And I can't combine 8 b cubed minus 3, so that is my answer. When I put 2b into the f machine, I get a result of 8b cubed minus 3. Why don't you guys try number 4 on your own? Please pause the video and see what you get after you work it out on your own. Once you've tried it, you should get this. f of a negative 3a equals a negative 3a raised to the third power minus 3, because you're putting it into the f machine. So a negative 3 times a negative 3 times a negative 3 is a negative 27. And a raised to the third power is just a cubed. So a negative 27 a cubed minus 3. And that is as far as you can go with this one as well, because a negative 27 a cubed and a minus 3 are different terms. We combine like terms, and we are left at that answer. All right. Number five, we're putting y divided by 4 into the g machine. So this is going in for this x, and it's going in for this x. So we have g of y divided by 4. That equals 3 times the quantity y, minus y divided by 4 quantity squared minus 3 times y over 4 subtract 2. All right, so once again, let's use our order of operations here. We're going to do exponents first. So y over 4 times y over 4. That's what y divided by 4 squared is saying. So y over 4 divided by y over 4. y times y is y squared. 4 times 4 is 16. So now I have this 3 times y squared over 16. Minus, if I multiply this, I'm just going to multiply fractions. 3 times y is 3. 1 times 4 is 4. So 3y, rather, sorry. So I have minus 3 fourths y, and then I subtract 2. So lastly, let's multiply this coefficient of 3 over here, so 3 times y squared is 3y squared over 16 minus 3y over 4 minus 2. So you have a y squared term, you have a y term, and you have that 2, which is called a constant term. You can't combine those because they're all different terms. So our answer is left at 3y. 3 sixteenths y squared, or 3y squared over 16, minus 3 fourths y, minus 2. And that's what we get when we take g of y minus 4, of y divided by 4, sorry. All right, last one. You guys try it on your own. Pause the video, please. All right, so you hopefully you put it into the h machine, which is this one right here. So it's 3. First of all, let's define what we're doing here. h of a half equals 3 times x squared, and x is now 1 half. So 1 half squared plus 5 divided by a half. Order of operations says I'm going to do exponents first. So 1 half times 1 half is 1 fourth. So 3 times a fourth plus 5 divided by 1 half. If you take 5 and divide it by 1 half, you get 10. It's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So 5 times 2 is 10. OK, 3 times 1 fourth is 3 fourths plus 10. So our answer is 10 and 3 fourths. Or oftentimes, as I'm sure you've dealt with before, we deal with mixed fractions all the time. And sometimes that's more beneficial. You could have 43 fourths. Either of these answers, I will accept. I hope that lesson makes sense to you. I want to give you one um, tip about an Excel math problem that you might see. You might see something that looks like this. Is this a function? Well, to, de to determine if this is a function, it has to pass the vertical line test. And also has to pass the horizontal line test for it to be a one-to-one -one function. So 
let's just take our vertical line test. And if we move this to the side here, from left to right, it touches once, once, once. What I'm talking about right now, class, is this blue, is this blue line. It extends infinitely this way, and it extends infinitely down, and it extends infinitely up this way, and infinitely to the right that way. So this one can be kind of tricky because it touches once, 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 once. It only touches the blue line at one point, at one point, at one point, at one point. Now once we get to here, a lot of students think, oh, well, now they are running together. They're the exact same line. And it's very tricky because we haven't gotten to this yet. Um, and so I'm going to teach you in depth later on about this type of a graph. But even though it looks like it is touching it at more than one point, it actually is only touching it once and only one time. And then when it goes to the other side of the y-axis, once again, this part right here, it only touches this blue curve at one point at a time. So it is a function. The answer to this is yes. And then very similarly, if we were to talk about is this a one-to-one -one function, we would now change it to a horizontal line. And once again, we would say yes, it touches once, 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 once. And as we get up here, even though it kind of looks like it is, you know, runs alongside it or it, it runs with it, it actually still only touches it once and only one time. Once again, I could talk to you more about that if you have questions, but when you see this one in accelerated math, this one is a function, and not only is it a function, it is also a one-to-one -one function. So just so that you're aware of that. If you have any other um, questions on Excel math about a curve graph like this, feel free to come and ask me. I'd be more than happy to help you out with that. So that is our first lesson on functions and relations. Let me know if you have any questions.